Well, with the civil rights era of the 1960s, the edifice, the Jim Crow system, and with it, the edifice of this old view of Reconstruction finally crumbled. A whole series of scholars began to devote themselves to studying Reconstruction in new ways, and virtually every assumption was dismantled, um, and new, new views began to percolate out. Lincoln did not have a coherent plan of Reconstruction. Johnson was not the defender of the Constitution, but a stubborn, racist politician who was basically to blame for the collapse of his own administration. The radicals now were seen as idealists, precursors of the civil rights movement, not uh, just uh, vindictive people who hated the South. Sumner, Stevens, guys like this had worked for black rights long before there was any conceivable political benefit to be gained from it, so you could hardly just say they were doing it to bolster uh, immediate uh, you know, uh, political advantage. Um, and the, uh, uh, nor were the radicals a cabal that controlled the Congress. In fact, most Reconstruction legislation was passed by virtual unanimous Republican votes and had widespread support in the North. It wasn't just a tiny group pushing this uh, through. Even more startling was the revised version of Reconstruction in the South that began to emerge. One of the key works here was published in 1965 by Joel Williamson, After Slavery, a book by a, by a South Carolinian white scholar about Reconstruction in South Carolina, which saw it as a period of tremendous progress. The establishment of the first public school systems, efforts at economic uh, rebuilding, the attempt to create a interracial political democracy. Williamson widened the, the scope of discussion away from just the politics of Reconstruction to the vast social changes that were going on in the wake of the Civil War. We will talk about this, of course. Um, and on our reading list today, uh, this week, uh, the book, book by Litwack, where we only have a couple of chapters, they're long ones, though, but uh, which from the 70s, again, shows African Americans as key actors. That's another part of this revisionism. They were not just manipulated by others. They were not ignorant. They were not unworthy of participation. They were part of the, uh, his, they were historical actors in their own right. And uh, let me, as you read the Litwick book, let me emphasize, look at the footnotes. They're at the end. Look at the footnotes. The footnotes are an important part of that book because one of the arguments of previous historians for not including blacks in any significant way in the narrative had been there's no evidence. There's no evidence. Many of them were, they were illiterate. They didn't publish newspapers very much. They didn't write letters, diaries. How can we say? Litwack's footnotes are there to show you the stuff is there. If you dig, it is there. The voice of the black American is there. It is just laziness or prejudice to refuse to put it into the history. It's not that the material doesn't exist. So even though his footnotes are excessive, they're excessive for a reason. They had to force people to take this kind of material uh, seriously. Um, the revisionists went on to say black supremacy never existed. White Republicans controlled most of these governments. Uh, effective power rested with the white governors. Uh, and there was, re uh, there was corruption in Reconstruction, but it paled before the corruption in the North at this time, the whiskey rings, the credit mobile scandal. We'll talk about all this. In other words, corruption could not be blamed on the former slaves. It was a national phenomenon after the Civil War. Uh, it did not prove the uh, error, so to speak, of giving African-American men the right to vote. And then at the same time, the Klan came to be viewed, as it was, as a terrorist, violent bunch of criminals rather than a patriotic organization saving the white South from out of control blacks. So by the end of the 1970s, the old interpretation had been pretty much reversed. The heroes were now the radicals and the freed people, and the so-called redeemers, the people who overthrew Reconstruction, were the villains, and Reconstruction was seen as a time of significant progress. But even, so this was, the, the revisionism was a product of the Civil Rights Revolution. But as that impulse faded, new views in the 80s, 90s, began to come to the fore. In, in an article around that time, I coined the phrase totally unimaginatively, but it has stuck, 
post-revisionism. I couldn't figure out what to call the new group, so I just call them post-revisionist. That's what they're called now. Instead of seeing the Civil War and Reconstruction as the second American Revolution, like Charles Beard, or a reversion into barbarism, like Bowers, or a golden opportunity somehow missed, the revisionists, this new generation argued, actually, that radical Reconstruction wasn't all that radical. Very little actually changed. And of course, they focused on the failure to distribute land to the former slaves, the 40 acres of the mule. The political revolution went forward, but the economic revolution did not. The planter class survived the Civil War. They kept their land ownings in many places intact. Some historians argued that Reconstruction was therefore fundamentally superficial. And this mode of thinking extended to almost every aspect of the period by the 1980s. That continuity, rather than change, was the hallmark of the period. Ra racism survived. In other words, not that much happened in Reconstruction. Now, um, and also legal scholars argued, well, you know, they never went around. Thaddeus Stevens said, let's treat them as con conquered provinces, but very few Republicans were willing to go outside the parameters of the Constitution. They revised the Constitution, but they didn't just chuck it away and say, we're going to do whatever we want. And constitutionalism itself was a barrier to far-reaching change, according to this, um, this view. Um, and uh, one can go further with that, that the, 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 the schools that were set up, which are often seen as a great progress, critics of education began to argue in a good post-1960s mode, no, no, the role of education is just to discipline people. So it's just to make these blacks into willing and disciplined workers. It doesn't really empower people to get education, so let's not make a big deal about the schools. Other scholars, like Thomas Holt, uh, in a very influential book called Black Over White, argued that class divisions among African Americans were part of the reason for the failure of Reconstruction. In other words, you shouldn't, uh, correctly, you shouldn't just look at the freed people as a mass, undifferentiated, that there were well-to-do, or at least better off, former slaves and former free blacks, and that, in fact, that they didn't really represent the interests of of the mass of the former slaves, and that struggles between free, uh, former free and former slaves kind of undermine the unity of black political uh, leadership. Um, so this, this whole view was actually very dramatically different because if any assumption had united the Dunningites, the revisionists, Du Bois, Williamson, you name them, it was the radicalism of Reconstruction. You can either say that was a horrible thing, or you can say, oh, they, that was a good thing. But the notion that Reconstruction was conservative was a real uh, uh, change in outlook and not 100% persuasive in explaining an era where all contemporaries felt they were in the midst of far-reaching, wrenching, turbulent change. If you'd gone back to 1870 and told people nothing is happening, they would have looked at you very, in, with, in a very peculiar way because everybody felt that society was undergoing rapid uh, transformation, whether they thought it was good or bad. Um, the the post-revisionist view, I think, reflected a kind of post-civil rights era skepticism that the, the great achievements of the civil rights era had not eliminated black poverty, had not eliminated racism from American life. And that was then read back to Reconstruction, that the failures of Reconstruction were sort of the, because of the limits of, of, of change and the limits of aspirations, and that, in other words, the deep, the depths of persistent racism uh, kind of foiled both the first and second Reconstructions according to this, according to this point of view. Another irony is that this critique of Reconstruction, in many cases, not all, had the ironic result of relegating former slaves back to the position of being manipulated by others, um, passive victims of white manipulation. So the Freedmen's Bureau comes down and forces them into schools, forces them into labor contracts. Uh, this doesn't explain why African Americans 
wanted the Freedmen's Bureau there and demanded that the Freedmen's Bureau stay and wanted schools. If schools had just been, it, in other words, they were all mistaken. They wanted education. They didn't realize, like the new uh, avant-garde theorists, that, you don't, that education is actually just another form of, uh, of social control. Well, by the late 80s, the inadequacies of this post-revisionist view were shown in the fact that the word revolution began creeping back into the vocabulary of Reconstruction. My book, which was published in 88, I think, 1988, uh, the subtitle, not the short version on the reading list, but the longer version, um, is America's Unfinished Revolution. Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. I guess I have to try to have it both ways there. It was a revolution. It didn't quite accomplish what it set out, but it left a kind of agenda for future generations to try to deal with. But, but the revolution in scholars of that period, and even up to today, was not the Beardian revolution of industrialists supplanting agrarians in control of uh, national politics, but emancipation being the revolution. It is the destruction of slavery, which is the revolutionary uh, dynamic of the Civil War Reconstruction era. Uh, 